All right, so welcome back to the channel. So what we're going to do today is a little different than what we normally do. Today we're gonna to do an in-depth algorithm analysis. The algorithm we're going to analyze is going to be bubble sort. So if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel and like this video. My goal is to make this channel one of the largest channels, one of the largest resources for software engineering prep. And this is one of those fundamental building block videos that I want to do to improve one's algorithm analysis skills. Okay, so what does bubble sort do? We're going to look at some examples, but what are the two fundamental operations in any comparison sorting algorithm? We're going to have comparisons and we're going to have swaps. Okay, so we have pseudocode here to my right and we have an array to my left. And keep in mind we are indexing off of one. In programming, normally we index off of zero, but for this pseudocode example, we're going to index off of one. So this is the first position, this is the second. Let me number them just to be clear. Okay, so what does bubble sort do? Bubble sort says, I'm going to go from n all the way to the second element in a decrementing fashion, and I'm going to try to bubble up the largest item that should be in the position I'm bubbling up to. So follow me. What we're going to do is we're going to choose n as the first position we want to bubble up a large item to. So this is what happens. So for the fifth position, my goal is whatever the largest item is back here, my goal is to get that largest item into the fifth position. So what I want to do is for each position, I want to get the appropriate item to that position. So what I'm going to do is I want to say for position five, I want the largest item in the array in position five. So what I'm going to do is I start at position one. And this is where our inner loop takes place. So our inner loop is going to say, I want the best item at position five. Five is N. I want the best item to be here. How am I going to get it there? I'm going to start at the front of the array. I'm going to start at J equals one. And what I'm going to do is, and I just changed these to I and J so it's more clear. We want to bubble up to point I. And what we're going to do is we're going to start at J. We'll start at the front of the array. And what we will do is we're going to do a comparison. And if the comparison succeeds, we're going to do a swap. So the comparison, when do we want to swap an item? So my J is here. What I compare J to, I compare J to J plus one. I compare this to the item to its right. So is 20 greater than five? And the answer is yes. So since the answer is yes, we swap these items. So do you see how we just swapped these items? And now do you see that J increments itself and we go to the next iteration of the inner loop. And this whole inner loop is trying to achieve the outer loop's purpose to place the largest item at index i, or not index, we're indexing off of one, but position i. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another comparison. Do you see how we are bubbling up the item to the position we want it to be at? So what we're going to do is do another comparison. So is 20 greater than three? It is, so perform a swap. Okay, so we just did another swap and do you see how it's bubbling up? This is how bubble sort sorts. So we do another comparison, J versus J plus one. Is 20 greater than seven? Yes, it is. So we perform a swap operation. And now J is sitting right behind I, but we don't stop. We only stop once we go past this position for J. So what happens is we do 20 versus eight. Who is the winner? 20 is the winner. And do you see how now J has come to where I is? And the way we stop this loop is we go from one to I minus one. So we've passed the position that is right before I. So do you see how now, do you see how the 20, the 20 is in the position it's supposed to be. The 20 is in the position it is supposed to be in. And now the job of bubble sort is now, what bubble sort wants to do is this. J is going to start at the beginning of the array again. It's going to start at position one. And what is going to happen is I want the second largest element. I want I to at the, at the second largest position. I want to put the correct item here. So this is how bubble sort works. We're going to want to place here. 
place here, place here, place here. And to find the element that belongs there, we'll start at the beginning of the ray every time. And we're going to go all the way up to that index doing swaps. So this is how bubble sort works. What is the time complexity that bubble sort operates in? It operates in big O of n squared. We provide an upper bound on the runtime as big O of n squared. So our job today is to describe why that is the case. Why is it big O of n squared? What is the best case? What is the average case? And what is the worst case for running bubble sorts on an unsorted array? That is our job today. And that is what we are going to look at. So now I want us to think about what are the best average and worst cases going to be for sorting an array with bubble sort. So let's look at that right now. Okay, so before we go in depth and analyze the best average and worst case, I want you to know what they look like. We need to know what they look like so we know how many comparisons and how many swap operations are going to occur. So what we're going to do is let's look at the best, worst, and average case. So the best case is going to be that the array is already sorted. If the array is already sorted, then what's going to happen when I hit these if statements? The if statement was, will fail every time. When I hit the if statement, when I compare one to two, will I do a swap? I won't do a swap. When I get to two and three, will I do a swap? I'm not going to do a swap. When I go to three and four, will I do a swap? I'm not going to do a swap. Do you see? How none of these swaps will happen, but our comparisons will stay the same. I will always do comparisons, but I'm not always going to do swaps. So that's how our cases change, if that makes sense. So our best case is I never need to do a swap. I already have a sorted array, but I'll do all my comparisons and we'll look at what that looks like. So the worst case, I have to do a swap every time. So five and four, I swap. Five versus three, I swap. Five versus two, I swap. And again, the reason I said that is because we're bubbling five upwards to the last position. I'm going to have to swap every time if the array is in reverse sorted order. This is the worst case of bubble sort. And this is when we would always have to do this. We would always execute the swap statement in the if statement. We always do the purple, we always do the comparison, but will we always do the blue? Will we always do the swap? We will always do the swap for the worst case. We will never do the swap for the best case. So for the average case, average case is what you would expect. Average case is we'll do some swaps, we won't do some swaps. It really depends on what we're going to do. So for that, we're going to look at that analysis and it'll be a little more involved than the best and worst, but we'll look at that in due time. So I think we are prepared to jump straight into the analysis. But first, I need to familiarize you with some notation. OK, so before I go into analyzing complexities and stuff, I want to familiarize us with summation notation. So whenever we see this sigma sign, this like big E, it means we're going to take the sum of these contents and these contents are going to be parameterized by a variable that we define as a counter. So each time this counter will increase by one. Our counter is I. We start the counter at one. Our counter will go from one to N. So if N is three, so imagining n is 3, if n is 3, we're going to do 1 is the start of our counter. Our counter starts at 1. 1 plus 2 plus 3, because we're substituting our counter into this equation. And this equation just has the value of our counter, which is i. So we see n equals 3, we go from 1 to 3. We do our sum 1, we do 2, we do 3. So this is how summation notation works. We just inject this variable into this statement and we take the sum from one to the end of the sequence. So what does this look like? So this looks like one plus two plus three plus dot 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 plus n minus two plus n minus one plus n. Remember that we go from one to n. And this is called um, Gauss's formula. And what this uh, comes from is, it comes from a, a, a famous derivation by a dude named Gauss. I 
I'm not sure what his last name is, but I'm going to put links below as to why this is actually true. I could do a video on math, but I don't want us to get stuck on the math of this. But what the summation from 1 to n is equivalent to is, is going to be equivalent to just saying n times n plus 1 over 2. So this is equivalent to this. These are the equivalent statements. These are equivalent statements. Doing the summation from 1 to n is the same thing as evaluating this statement n times n plus 1 over 2. And again, I'll leave a link in the description for more information on the intuition behind that and the understanding, but I don't want to go over it because I don't want to get too mathy here, and it's pretty simple to understand. It's in the description. So now I think we are ready to start drawing our summations and start looking at the best case, the worst case, and the average case. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this pseudocode and reference it to draw our summations over here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to start with the worst case analysis. We're going to analyze the worst case runtime of bubble sort. What was the worst case? Do we remember? Worst case is we always swap. We swap at every single comparison. We will always do comparisons. We will always do the same amount of comparison, best, average, worst, but we will differ in the amount of times we swap. For the worst case, we always swap. So let's draw our first summation. Our first outer for loop goes from position n down to position 2. So let's draw a summation for that. Okay, and now do you see this summation right here? Do you see how we go from 2 to n? This is the amount of times the outer for loop will run. It's going to run this many times. We're going to run from 2 to n. We're going to do 2 to n. I is going to start at 2. We're acting as if we're going down to up instead of going from n down to 2. That's all we're doing. So this is the outer for loop amount of iterations. So for each of these iterations, we're going to do a certain amount of inner loop iterations. Do you see what we do? We go from 1 to i minus 1. So let's draw another summation. Okay, so we just got kicked out of that room we were just in, but what? <laughs> So we're going to continue with our summation. So we just expressed the outer for loop. We expressed the outer for loop. And now our job is to express the inner for loop. So we need to express the inner for loop. And we see that the inner for loop goes from 1 to i minus 1. So we already know how to express that as a summation. Let's express it as a summation. OK, so this is the amount of outer loops we will do. And for each outer loop, this is the amount of inner loop iterations we will do. And remember, this is the worst case. So since this is the worst case, what does that mean? We will always do the swap. We will always do the swap. Remember, we always do the comparisons, whether it's worst, average, or best. But we will always do the swap. So what does that mean? We're just going to put a 1 to signify a swap, a constant time operation. We will put a 1. So this is the summation. This is the summation for the amount of swaps that we are going to do in the worst case of an array in reverse sorted order. So let me just note that. Okay, so now my job is I need to turn these summations, I need to turn these summations into concrete mathematical statements of the concrete amount of swaps that bubble sorts for the worst case is going to do as n changes. So it's going to be for n. We want this in terms of n. So what we need to do is simplify our summations. So what we're going to do is look at this inner for loop. What does this really say? So what I want you to do is I want you to think of it like this. This inner for loop is going to be doing 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. How many times are we going to repeat this summation with just the value of 1? Do you see how I cannot inject j? j cannot be injected into the statement. The statement is always 1. So I do a bunch of 1 plus 1 plus 1. How many times do I do this? So what is the upper bound for our summation? The upper bound is i minus 1. What is the lower bound for our summation? The lower bound is 1. We start at 1. So I go from 1 to i minus 1. So how do I find the distance between these? The distance is we just subtract them. And what I do is I subtract the high bound from the low bound, 
and that gives me the amount of elements between them. But we have to add one. Why do we add one? The reason we add one is because the bounds are included. So here is an example. So if I ask you for the length of this array, how do I get the length of this array? I subtract the high bound by the low bound, two minus zero. But do you see how we have a two here? Do you see how the length of that array is not two, it is three. So what we do is, why do we add by one? We add by one because our bounds are inclusive. So if I had just said two, I'm excluding one of the bounds. So what I need to do is I need to add one to this and that gives me the total items inclusive between the two bounds. So what does our summation now become? So our outside summation stays the same. My outside summation stays the same, but what happens is my inside summation becomes high bound minus the low bound plus one. That is the amount of times that I am going to be adding one over and over and over. So do you see this now? Do you see high bound minus low bound plus one to include the bounds? And what does this simplify to? This simplifies to I minus one for the inside. So for each outer for loop, I'm going to be doing I minus one work. So we're not finished yet. I still have a summation sign. I need to simplify further. So remember that trick I told you? Remember that summation trick I told you? Let me write that formula right now so you remember it. Okay, so what was Gauss's trick? What was the Gauss formula that we saw before? So remember the summation from one to n, where i is our variable we inject into this inner part, the summation is going to be n times n plus one over two. This is the trick that we deduced before. We have this in our pocket. So what we see is this summation runs from two to n. So what is really happening? The first iteration, i is going to be two. What is two minus one? Two minus one is one. So two is gonna increment itself. Two is going to become three. What is three minus one? It's two. Okay, this was started at two, it became three, and now when it's four, four minus one is three. So this incrementing is gonna keep happening, and does this look familiar? Does this remind you of something before? Although this is starting at two and going to n, what is really happening here? We're going to go one, we're going to do that plus two plus three, and how far will we go? What is the final value in our sequence? Well, the final value is our upper bound. What is our upper bound? Our top bound is n. So when do we stop? We inject n into this equation as a value for i because i is our counter. The last value for i is n. So what we're going to do is n minus one is our last value, but let's count up to it. n minus three, n minus two, n minus one. This says one plus two plus three, all the way up to n minus one. What was Gauss's trick? Gauss's trick works for summations going from one to n, but this is a problem. I don't see n here. This does not go from one to n, but I would argue that that is incorrect. This does go to n, but our n is different. What is our final value? What is our n for this summation, for this summation? So the terminating value of the sequence, the n for this sequence, is going to be n minus one. So what do we plug in to the Gauss formula of n times n plus one over two? We plug in n minus one. That is our n. So now I have the ability to evaluate this outer summation. I can evaluate the outer summation. I plug n minus one into n times n plus one over two. So let's do that right now. Okay, and do you see how I plugged in n minus one? n minus one maps to the n there. n minus one maps to the n there. And do you see all we are doing is injecting n minus one for the values of n. So let's simplify this and then let's analyze what just happened. So I hope you were able to follow my path of logic. So what we get for the final amount, for the number of swaps, for the worst case, the worst case will always do the swap, what we get is n minus one times n over two. 
This is the amount of swaps we get. So the swaps for the worst case, we will always do a swap. This is how many swaps happen. N minus one times N over two. So let me ask you a question. How many comparisons happen for the worst case? Uh, if we think back to, yeah, I was like, uh, like, no, I, I'm a door. professor, mate. Don't go don't worry, just keep me on. Well, okay. D look away. No, I'm, not, I'm not looking at you. So again, thinking back to what I was saying before, is the amount of comparisons does not change. This if statement will always be hit. We will always compare, but will we always swap? That is the point of our analysis. So how many comparisons are we going to do? We're going to be doing n minus one times n over two comparisons for the best case, for the average case, and for the worst case. We will always do this many comparisons. It just happened. Oh, this boss, I have to keep that in mind. Yeah. We will always do the same amount of comparisons as the amount of swaps for the worst case because what happens is we enter the if statement every single time if it is in reverse sorted order. So this is the worst case and for the best case, what is going to happen is we are going to do how many swaps? We're going to do zero swaps. If an array is already sorted, this if statement will always fail. If an array is already sorted, we will never perform a swap operation and therefore the amount of swaps for the best case is going to be zero swaps. So now we're going to look at the average case, which is a little more involved than the best and the worst case because we need to look at a new statistical definition that I want to set up right now. So before we look at the average case, what happens in an average case is sometimes I swap, sometimes I do not swap. So what we need to do is we need to think about probabilities and something that's going to be important to us is something called an expected value. Again, I'm going to have links below for these terms because I don't want to go too deep into these side concepts, but what I really want to do is get the gist of this concept to you. So what we have here is a six sided die. We have a six sided piece of dice and what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what should I expect if I roll the dice. So what is the probability of each one of the possibilities? I can roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. So the chance, the chance of each of these possibilities is one over six. So what is the expected value if I roll this dice? And here's the notation for it. So what is the expected value going to be? The expected value is the sum of the possibilities times the chance of each possibility happening. So what is the sum of the possibilities? The sum of the possibilities is 21. What is the chance that each of these could happen? The chance of each of these happening is one over six. So the expected value, if I am to roll a six sided die, the expected value I'm going to expect to get is 3.5. And that's kind of weird because we can't roll a 3.5, but this is normal for expected values. Sometimes they come out to decimal amounts and we can't literally interpret this as we're going to roll a 3.5. But what this is, is it's sort of a mean measure for a probability from a chance event. So the key to understand about this is the possibility sum times the chance of each possibility is the expected value. Again, there's more information below, but we're going to continue and we're going to calculate our average case and I'm going to walk us through how we go about this. Okay, so now we can calculate the average case. So what do we do? Let's build our summations from this outside for loop. So I go from two to n. Okay, the outer for loop does not change and the inner for loop does not really change. So we go from one to i minus one. So let's express that. Okay, but this is the problem. This is why I taught you the expected value thing because what we're going to need to do is how many times am I actually gonna swap? Well, we established we will always do the comparisons but how many times am I going to swap? I have no idea. Am I going to swap? Am I not going to swap? I don't really know whether I'm going to swap or not, but I can calculate the expected value of a swap. So what we're going to do is represent a swap as a one, because it's a constant time operation, represent that as one operation. 
and we represent no swap as a zero. So how do we calculate expected value? We do it like this. So we see that our possibilities are no operation and doing an operation of swapping. And the chance per operation is one half. So what I'm going to do is calculate the expected value. I take the sum of the possibilities and multiply them by the chance per possibility to get this sort of possibility mean that we call the expected value. So it turns out to be this. So we're going to evaluate this expected value here. And what we're going to say is 0 plus 1 times 1 half. 0 plus 1 is just 1. So what is the expected value if we have an average case where I have no idea if it's a swap or not, based on our probabilities, our expected value is going to be one half. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this expected value as one half because we just did the math for it. We followed our definitions and we are going to turn that into one half. So let's do that simplification. So I just did a bit of simplification and plugging in. So all I did here is I changed our expected value, I plugged in one half. And what I did is I moved my constant outside of the summations because we can do that. And now again, we have this one in here. And do you remember for our worst case, this is exactly what we had before. So let's jump straight to the final step and have what our worst case was. Okay, so what we did here is all I did is I took this inner part and what I did is I did what we did before. We plug n minus one into Gauss's uh, formula and what we get is n minus one times n over two for the inside part and all we have is this constant outside one over two. I multiply the one over two to the inside and what I get is n minus one times n over four. This is the amount of swaps the swaps we will do, the swaps for the average case. For the average case, we've taken into account our probabilities and now we know the amount of swaps we do in the average case. What we're going to do in terms of comparisons, we do the same amount of comparisons. We'll do n minus one times n over two comparisons like before, same amount of comparisons as the best, worst, and average, but what we do different is the amount of swaps. We will do less swaps than the worst case, and we're definitely doing more swaps than the best case. The best case will do zero swaps. This is the in-depth analysis of bubble sort, and this is what I wanted you to see. When I say n squared for an algorithm, or I say that something is going to be linear time, I don't always mean it's a straightforward derivation. From this, it's obvious that this is going to be n squared because you see that we have an n here and an n here, and when we drop constants and drop these weak factors, we're just going to have the n's dominating. It becomes O of n squared. All right, so that is all for this video. We really dug deep and looked at the exact number of swaps that this algorithm is going to do for the best average and worst case, and this is what it is all about, providing bounds for each of these. So that is all for this video. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe to this channel. I might do more of these, I might not. There are just so many interview questions that I have to cover that it's hard to go in depth and do an in-depth thing like this for every single topic we cover because there's so many questions we need to know. But that is all for this video. And it's always a weird ending. Thanks, don't make it weird. It's hard.